Good morning and welcome on this Easter Sunday. This is the Reverend Judy Rigby from Airport West Uniting Church and I've put together something of what I've prepared for our service this morning into this video. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. As I begin, I want to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the lands on which we live, learn, work and worship, and pay our respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I want to also acknowledge the commitment of the Uniting Church to work for reconciliation and justice. I think it's the end of the world. Looks like I've seen it all. Well, that's it for me. I'm glad it's you, Chunky. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. Welcome to our tomorrow! Let us pray. We understand something of the emotion in that video clip we've just seen, O Risen Christ. We thought you were dead. We thought the cross was the end. We thought that when the stone rolled over the tomb, that was it. But this is it. The dead are living. The cross is empty. The stone is rolled. And one word describes it all. Hallelujah. Jesus is risen. We thought you had said your final word. We thought those with the power had won. We thought that when you cried out, that was it. But this is it. The word breathes. The powers are defeated. The final cry was only the beginning. And one word says it all. Alleluia. Jesus is risen. We thought the story was finished. We thought the hope had ended. We thought that when the tomb was sealed, that was it. But this is it. The story has just begun. The hope is newly born. The tomb is empty. And one word says it all. Alleluia. Jesus is risen. This is the news. Jesus is risen. This is the moment. Jesus is alive. This is the gospel. Jesus is with us. We thought that when they crucified you, death had defeated life, and that was it. But this is it. Love is stronger than death, and one word says it all. Alleluia. Jesus is risen. The scriptures for today include 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 11 and Mark chapter 16 verses 1 to 8. You might like to pause the video and look these up. We are all familiar with the saying, seeing is believing. Variations include, I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it or I will believe it when I see it. You can probably recall moments in which you've used these words in one form or another. Generally, the adage holds true. But what about those hard to believe situations despite what you see before you? That incredible magician's act where a coin is coaxed from a sealed bottle or something disappears from a box that is suspended in mid-air and surrounded by a flaming hoop. Or someone you know who was dead and buried in a tomb, you now see, is no longer there. The women who visited the tomb on that first Easter morning in order to anoint the body of Jesus, and Mark names Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, not only saw an empty tomb, 
its stone rolled aside, but a young man sitting to one side who told them, He is not here. He is risen from the dead. Go and tell his disciples that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. Unlike the other Gospels, which go on to tell us that the women did see the risen Christ and ran back, ran back to tell the disciples, the earliest manuscripts of Mark's Gospel end straight after they saw that young man and heard his news. Mark concludes, the women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. While the other Gospels do talk about this fear, even terror, Mark leaves us with an account that ends with it. In Mark, all of the women flee, terrified and afraid, not yet able to embrace the dazzling light that had come into their darkness. As author Marianne Williamson has observed, it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We know that the women at some point in this story do see Jesus and proclaim him as alive. But let me stay with this fear for a while. Because what happens when fear of the light rather than the darkness we know drives us? Our reading from 1 Corinthians 15 today is one of the earliest written accounts of the resurrection. Written a couple of decades before the gospel accounts by the Apostle Paul, in which he unpacks the resurrection story. Although it must be said, he does leave out the women. But that aside, he frames his, his account as good news. Let me remind you of the good news, he writes. This is the good news. Christ died, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. But let us cast our minds back to the story of Paul, formerly known as Saul. What do we know of him before he became the famous apostle? If we were, if we were to turn back to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, before he was the Apostle Paul, Saul was the young man who was present at the stoning of the first martyr and who after that spearheaded a severe persecution against the church in Jerusalem, who breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord was on his way to ask the high priest to sanction accelerated action against them when a light from heaven flashed around him and the voice of Jesus confronted him, after which he was left blind for three days. How much of the violence in the world is driven by people wanting to stay in the darkness of their deeds, the darkness of their heart, afraid of what they will lose if they step into the light? It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. The resurrection story, which shines dazzling light into the darkest hour, calls us to step into that light, which most frightens us. Returning to Paul's account of the resurrection, he gives us a chronology of how the risen Christ was seen first according to Paul, by Peter, then the twelve, then more than 500 of his followers at one time, some of whom, he says, were still alive. The implication being, why don't you go ask them? And then James and later, by all the apostles. Last of all, writes Paul, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. But we know from the Acts that Paul didn't see the historical Jesus. His experience on the Damascus Road was of light and voice. 
And we also know that some of the disciples who did see him didn't always recognise him, at least not straight away. Mary only saw him when he spoke her name. The disciples on the Emmaus Road only saw him when he broke the bread. Seeing is not always believing. At least seeing in the active sense of the verb is not always believing. Paul writes his resurrection account in the passive voice. Christ was seen by. There was nothing special about any of those first disciples. They were not giants of the faith. Paul didn't have any special wisdom. It's entirely the movement of Jesus towards them that helps them to see. And clearly that seeing involves more than the use of physical eyes. Seeing the risen Christ is the point at which faith steps in. It's the point to which we are invited. There's something heartening in this, that the risen Christ appears, that he makes himself known, that we can see him, that we can recognise him in the stuff of our lives, in the natural world, in the most unexpected places. Christ still comes to us. How do we see him? When I was working as a pastoral care at the women's hospital some years ago, one of the midwives died unexpectedly in her sleep. She was young. She was pregnant with her first child. It was a terrible tragedy. The nurse unit manager of the ward in which she worked asked me to organise a memorial service for her. And the event promised to be huge. Her family were invited as well as her colleagues. There was a lot of work to be done. And as part of that organising, I went to the maternity ward to meet with the unit manager and she wasn't there. I had to wait for her, not without some annoyance, I must admit. I was standing there listening to the sounds of labour when the doors of one of the delivery rooms burst open and, and a midwife came out holding a silent bluish baby. Everyone stopped what they were doing. Another nurse moved towards them, but the first midwife waved her away with one hand, with one hand and placed the baby down on the table with another and began to work on him or her. We all held our breath until that baby cried. And then it was as if the spell was broken. We all then picked up from where we were. The unit manager arrived. I completed my business with her and I left the ward. It wasn't until later, after the memorial service was over, that I realised that into the darkness of this untimely loss, we had witnessed resurrection, life in the midst of death. Similarly, we are invited this day to talk about, to wonder where it is that we see Jesus. How does Jesus, how does this risen Christ come to us again and again? How is he seen by us and by the world? Today is the day to tell those stories of how we have seen Jesus, where we have recognised him, to proclaim him alive and to step into the light to embrace it, to let it overcome our fear. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen. I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance then
Sabbath and I cured the lame, the holy people, they said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high and they left me there on a cross to die. Dance them wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance and he. Dance at ease. 